So um, the Rostock model, and we also have a sister model um, called Comstock. And I'm going to be discussing um, Rostock today because that's the model I primarily work on. Rostock is for the residential stock and Comstock is for the commercial stock. Um, together, they, they um, will model the entire building stock of the US. Um, so what Rostock and Comstock are, they're, real, they're highly granular um, models that can model energy use nationally, but also can be sliced to be able to look at um, local and regional um, patterns. So how do we actually go about building this model? The really key thing that underlies Rostock is this housing stock characteristics database. So I mentioned we don't have any sort of um, you know, national registry of all buildings in the United States, but we do have a lot of different um, surveys um, and pieces of information that we can pull together from different data sources. It's not all in a single data source, um, but there are these surveys that we can pull together. So one of the main ones we use is this residential energy consumption survey. So this is a detailed, um, a detailed survey that's done by the US government periodically. Um, to collect you know, some information on what are the, the physical characteristics of homes, especially those characteristics that are influential for energy use. The sample size is um, relatively small on RECs. We can't break it down to the state level yet. Um, at the moment, you know, most of the, the stuff is at uh, either census division, which is groupings of maybe four to five states. Um, it, sometimes those states are, are really quite different and it creates a problem trying to understand some of the differences um, for example, the Pacific Census Division includes Hawaii and Alaska, which you know, themselves are, are kind of unique cases, as well as California, Oregon, and Washington. So those five states are all grouped together um, in the same census division, so it becomes kind of a challenge in, in um, understanding what's really happening when you know, Alaska and California are really different places. Um, we also pulled together um, some other uh, information. So. Um, the American Community Survey and the American Housing Survey are done by the US Census Bureau. So it focuses a little bit less, it has some building characteristics, but it focuses a lot more on, um, like the American Community Survey does more with demographics, but as part of this, we get some information on, uh, good information on detailed housing counts, for example, out of this. Um, we also um, pull together where we can information on um, fuel costs, since it varies widely across the country, um, and uh, you know upgrade measure costs. Um, as I mentioned, we're climatically really diverse. So also one of the key inputs is um, a full set of national TMY weather data. Um, this map that I'm showing, the little tiny uh, weather map on here is a little bit old. We actually do a, an individual weather file for every county in the US now. So that's 3000 different um, weather files that we use um, underneath the model. So what do we do with these data sources? So what we do is we develop a conditional probability distribution network of all these different characteristics. So we're pulling together different pieces of information from different surveys um, and trying to provide this, this probability network to describe the whole US housing stock. Um, and if we don't have data to, to fill, fill in, um, you know, really specifically what's happening, um, we basically will apply the probability at a full national level. So let me kind of describe what this looks like. So this is just a, um, a toy example. I think what I'm actually about to show is for the state of, uh, for, uh, in California. So this is a breakdown of um, the probability breakdown of buildings by type. So you can see the vast majority are single family detached homes. Um, we have some single family attached, which are kind of like, like row houses um, and then different, um, different sizes of multifamily buildings. So this is a, you know, a breakdown for the region that we're looking at of these, these building types. Then we could say, okay, so within homes that are single family detached, where are they located? As I mentioned, this is a California specific example. Uh, California has their own climate zones. It's like kind of its um, whole separate thing. But to, to give you an example of these 48% of single family detached homes, here's our breakdown of where they're located in the different California climate zones. So breaking that up any further. So within single family homes in climate zone eight, then we can do an age breakdown. Um, based on the survey data that we have. Okay, so um, actually, you know, how old are they? What percent are they? You can see primarily pre-1950s vintage for this particular sector that we're looking at. Um, but then we were saying, okay, so what if we were to look at 1980s homes? So then we start building out all these different characteristics. So if you're looking at single family detached homes in climate zone eight built in the 1980s, we can start adding on these, um, these physical characteristics of the home. And as I mentioned, sometimes this is coming from, from Rex. Um, you know, we, we don't have a survey that says this is exactly um, everything that's happening in this climate zone in this, this location, but we can do like a dependency on vintage and say in US 1980s homes in this region of the country, 
here's kind of the breakdown of the Attican solution that we see and all these different characteristics. So we continue to build this out um, you know, things looking at heating fuel walls. And these, these are just some examples. We have 105 different characteristics that are influential to building energy modeling that we build out within this network. So once we have this network built out, um, we then, um, so here's, I'm oh, sorry, here's the 105 different characteristics we use. Each one of these represents an individual file with the probabilities broken down. So you can see, I have an example here on the, the location region. So we have these regions that we've created. Uh, so it depends on region, it depends on vintage. Um, and then from that, we define the insulation level. I believe this is uh, insulation of the crawl space at a home. So to kind of give you an example of what these files actually look like. So once we've built out this full network, um, what we then do to, to simulate the US housing stock is we sample it. If we were to do kind of a more traditional prototypical approach, where we just wanted to develop some prototypes to represent the US, um, if we wanted to say, what's my prototype for single family homes and climate zone eight built in the 1980s, um, this would be the home that you'd get. get. You'd, it'd have gas heating, uh, R30 in the attic, R11 in the walls, double pane windows, a SEER 10 air conditioner, and an 80% efficient uh, natural gas furnace. So this is the, the average or typical um, for this, this, um, this particular kind of prototype. However, what we do in raw stock, as opposed to just saying, like, here's our one prototype that represents this segment of the stock, um, we're going to increase our sample size to um, start getting more of these less usual cases. Um, you know, so uh, R38 attics, for example, are not the most common um, attic installation level. However, it's still 22% of the homes within this, this um, segment of the stock. So what we do um, is we sample this full conditional probability distribution network. We use something called quota-based sampling, um, which is a deterministic approach. And um, if you do a sample of one, you get the most common building type as you increase the, the sample size, it starts filling out the tails of the distribution. So once we've sampled from this, we have this synthetic building stock for the US um, where we have you know, the sample buildings and all of these 105 different characteristics assigned to each one of them. Um, we then take each one of those rest stock inputs and we translate it to um, via op Open Studio to an Energy Plus model. So for everything that we've called out in these conditional probability distribution networks, they're translated into Open Studio arguments so that we automatically create these models. Um, we then simulate them. Um, I, I know that uh, most of you are probably familiar with, to some extent with Energy Plus and Open Studio. Uh, Energy Plus, they're actually both also developed by NREL, um, but I know they're, they're widely used outside the, um, the US as well. But, but basically these are physics-based um, simulations of heat transfer within buildings that provide detailed sub-hourly simulations of, um, of energy use. Um, because REST stock is built upon Energy Plus, um, it also runs at the, the same um, time scale of a year. So we'll do a year of simulation at a time. Um, and we're able to provide, uh, able to pull out the um, time series data for every single one of those buildings in the synthetic stock. Um, and that provides a lot of flexibility. So um, to give some examples on the right here, we have the Comstock uh, building types and major end uses. We can slice a little more than this. Those are the main things that we pull out of um, rail stocks. We generally have kind of these um, five home types that we look at. There's different ways we can slice it as well. Um, and we cover all kind of the major um, energy um, uses within the, the home. So in the US, uh, for the, if we're doing a full national US run, we do um, a little over half a million um, individual building energy models to do the, the baseline US stock. So this is just to say, if I wanna simulate the US housing stock as it is right now, we'd kick off 550,000 individual building uh, models in Energy Plus. Um, we do this using usually using the supercomputer we have at NREL, um, it's called Eagle. Um, we also have a workflow developed where you can um, set up the simulations to run on Amazon Web Services to, so to do cloud computing. Um, we do have some external stakeholders that use the AWS workflow as well, but usually for projects in, internally, we use the supercomputer that we have at the lab. Um, oops, I have some duplicate sites. So with that kind of like introduction to the model, um, I'm now going to talk through three different um, case studies for, for how we've used it and kind of give give you a, um, a practical idea of some of the different ways that we use REST stock in different applications. So the first I'm gonna talk about is the national typology study that we are currently in the middle of for, for the US. Um, so um, 
we were interested in developing a typology of the, the US building stock. As I mentioned, it's really diverse. Um, currently, the US Department of Energy is um, really focused on um, how do we decarbonize the building stock. Um, as you saw at the beginning, you know, it's, it's about a third of US carbon emissions are in, in the building stock. So um, DOE is really looking for, for ways to get about this. Um, a huge part of our housing stock um, is, is um, older. You know, we, we do have some new construction, um, but obviously residential retrofits is going to be a huge part of this. So we were tasked um, by DOE as kind of a first step is to kind of understand, okay, so what actually should we be focusing on? What is the priority? What does the landscape look like in the U.S.? So this is the study we're in the middle of. So we started by doing a literature review. Um, you know, kind of understanding what else had been done out there. Um, we first looked at some US-based studies um, that were, they did typologies, but they tended to be regional. So, you know, um, there, there was some work done in California where they were looking to retrofit multifamily buildings since so they developed some, some sub-typologies of multifamily buildings in California. Same thing, there was some work done in the state of New York. Um, so these are localized uh, typology studies, very focused on near-term deployment. Like we have these buildings, how do we retrofit them, you know, in a month or a year? Um, but really nothing, nothing uh, national. Um, the existing national typology studies, you all are likely um, familiar with a lot of them. Most of them are in Europe. You know, the Tabula project is a uh, one that covers a, a lot of European countries and, um, but really um, nothing was found from the US. We also kind of reviewed some other ways of segmenting um, building stocks and some of the existing building stock energy models kind of as a byproduct sometimes um, make these typologies. Um, but really the, the big takeaway from our literature review is there's not an existing comprehensive national typology um, for the United States in the way that we, we talk about our building stock. So what are the outcomes of the study that we're, we're trying to get at for DOE? So in the near term, um, we're looking to um, identify basically what are the near term wins? Are, what are the things that will be easy to retrofit in the United States? Are there, um, are there things that don't really require much uh, research and development and new technologies? You know, if, if we were to say, okay, go to this segment of the stock and just swap out the heating system for a heat pump, does that get us most of the way there to decarbonizing the housing stock? Um, and I should also mention, I'm going to be focusing more on the residential side. The study also covers the commercial stock as well. Um, and then, uh, so kind of identifying, are there, there are areas that are clear ones that are, are easy to deal with and we should deal with them right now. Then also longer term, we're, we also want to identify segments of the, the building stock that um, maybe we don't have good solutions for right now, that either require new technology development, um, and DOE also does a lot of work in um, research and development for building technologies. So helping them identify, you know, kind of what are the needs and what are the priorities? If we're really serious about retrofitting the US building stock to get to zero carbon, um, what does that look like? And, and also a huge part of this is getting the costs down so that it becomes economically feasible to do a lot of these retrofits. So um, some of this work will be used also for trying to set um, cost targets for new technologies coming to the market. So the approach that we're taking for this typology work, because we have Rostock stock and Comstock, is a little bit different than sometimes you see in other um, typology work. Um, in some typology work, you see where you kind of assess your, your national building stock. You segment into the, the you know, kind of reasonable chunks that you think are most representative of the, the building stock, um, maybe prioritize them. Um, and then uh, often, sometimes it's the whole thing, sometimes it's just the top ones, you provide some characterization we will go in and, and try to collect extra information on the important thermal characteristics of the building. Um, and then often at the end of that process, uh, the building is simulated. Because Rostock and Comstock are already doing this kind of like national um, sampling, we actually have all the characteristics before we even run the model. Like we, we have the full appended um, characteristics. We know, you know which, um, what percent of homes have uh, ducted heating versus non-ducted heating. Um, or, you know, kind of what is the existing state of um, uh, air leakage and infiltration in homes, for example. So because of this, it provides us a really flexible approach that we have this full characterization. And once we run the model, all the results are there. So we can play around with segmenting the stock in different ways. And so we've been working with DOE and a working group of industry partners um, and kind of coming up with this. But also after we're done with the typology study, someone else could take our results, the raw rest stock and comp stock results and do their own segmentation on this. So for the residential sector, um, here are the preliminary segmentation parameters we've decided upon for, um, for segmenting our typology. 
So climate zone is a big one. So we're using kind of these five aggregated climate zones for the US uh, building type. Um, wall structure, this ended up being um, a little more, uh, and talking to some of our industry partners, more important than we thought. In the US, we have a lot of wood frame construction. Uh, most of our homes are, are wood frame. And for some of the um, retrofit solutions that have been proposed, um, for example, exterior panelized retrofit. So you, as opposed to, you know, adding insulation to the wall, you put something on the outside of the building, uh, like a, an insulated panel um, as a retrofit solution. A lot of the wood frame homes um, actually structurally can't support the weight of panels like that. So one of the things we use for our segmentation, just to get it a first pass of maybe the structural capacity of the home. So uh, without modification, bear the weight of those panels, we used wall structure. And the other thing uh, we looked at for segmenting was the vintage of the building. Rustog does it more detailed than this, but we kind of bend it into the three most um, critical periods of, um, of vintages for homes in the US. Um, you know, pre-1940, so like the really old kind of leakier stuff, uh, the mid-century, which is before you really had um, serious energy codes in um, the residential sector, and then post-1980, where you see kind of increasing levels of, of uh, energy codes and energy efficiency. All in all, this gives us 165 segments for the residential stuff. So this is a, an example result um, from one of the climate zones. So at the top there, you can see it's the cold, very, very cold climate region. Uh, you can see there's a little map um, where all the blue stuff, it covers actually a huge portion of the US, um, the cold, very cold climate region. Um, as, and then on the left of this, the graph here, you can see all the different segments broken down. You can see it broken down by building type, wall structure, and those vintage bins. The first column of results here is the building count within that climate zone in that segment. Uh, the second column is the average size of that building. The third column is the um, the thermal load intensity. I should I should also mention, we're not showing lug loads in this particular graph, partly because of the framing of the project. So it's focused on HVAC and water heating. Um, so you can see the average load intensity. And then if I go through one more, and this is the total segment thermal energy use. Um, so uh, it, and so if you're looking here, um, it's pretty clear to see like right away, just from like looking at this total energy use by segment, single family detached wood frame houses, houses are really uh, for this climate zone, um, really the, the most significant contributor to, uh, to energy use. Um, and most of it's in the form of heating. Um, another distinction we make here is off of the, um, the color. So the, the dark red is fossil fuel based heating and the uh, kind of more pastel or the lighter red is a electric based heating. And so you can see the vast majority of homes are burning fossil fuel on site in this climate zone. So, you know, kind of right away, if you're thinking about decarbonization, um, there's a clear takeaway that so much, uh, so much fossil fuels being burned on site is, is clearly a major barrier. Even if you're reducing the carbon emissions from your electric grid, um, something needs to be done about reducing it within the home. Um, in a lot of this particular region, um, it's actually not even natural gas, it tends to be heavy fuel oils um, and, you know, homes will have big tanks that get filled up with fuel oil. So it's, it's actually a, a significant challenge to be able to retrofit these homes um, in a way that uh, can, provide, can provide heating and replacing those old systems. Um, similar to, so that was uh, the cold, very cold climate region. We did this for the other five climate regions as well. Um, so you can start to see, so this is the mixed humid, which is the southeast U.S., in the hot, hot, dry, mixed, dry, which is the Southwest United States. Um, so you can see for mixed humid, um, it's still single family wood frame homes. Um, you're getting a little bit higher proportion of electric heating in that particular region. Um, for the hot, dry, mixed, dry, um, we see actually not wood frame homes, but masonry homes tend to be a lot more common in that region of the country. Um, often this is like concrete block walls in this particular area. Um, so you can see, you know, the strategies that we might end up developing for these different regions might, might vary quite a bit just based upon the existing technologies and, and wall types. Um, you can see in the hot region, you're obviously seeing some more cooling um, because it's a quite air, hot area of the country. This is two more climate regions. This is the hot humid, um, which is the, the far southeast and the marine climate zone, which is like all along just right on the west coast. So for hot humid, um, significant amounts of cooling. Um, also really a uh, pretty high proportion of electric heating already in that region, although especially in single family, you're still seeing some fossil fuel. Um, in the marine climate region, this is a, because it's coastal, it tends to be a really um, temperate, so not very hot, not very cold climate region. 
Um, so you, you, especially multifamily buildings, you're seeing water heating as uh, one of the more significant drivers as opposed to the heating loads themselves, kind of depending on which segment you're looking at. So basically what we've done in the study is um, taken res stock, develop these segments of the, the US housing stock in a way that we're able to kind of go in and start investigating. So what are the right retrofit solutions? So as I mentioned, this work is under uh, underway right now. Um, what I'm showing you right now is just base rest stock run without any sort of upgrades yet. Um, we have a draft report on this um, that should be released probably within the next couple of months. Um, we are planning on next, the next phase of the project is, okay, so here's the, the baseline stock. So what are the strategies we can use for actually retrofitting it? So we're, we, as I mentioned, we're going to try some of the easier measures. What if you just swap out equipment? What if we just put in a heat pump uh, for space heating and a heat pump for water heating? How close would that get us? Like how much is this going to reduce the thermal load just by um, you know, electrifying and using some of those high efficiency technologies? And kind of increasing in our complexity of the retrofit that we model. Um, you know, what if we start swapping out windows and some of these really more intense things? Or what if we model an exterior panel that really changes the thermal characteristics of the wall? Um, we also um, are developing kind of an online dashboard um, where, where anybody can go in and, and look at the results themselves and maybe re-aggregate and say like, well, I didn't want to look by this climate zone, let's look at the state level, um, as a way to, to try to get some of these results out there. A lot of decision making in the US happens, not at the national level, but state and local level. So trying to get some of that information to local stakeholders who are also really interested in decarbonizing their building stocks. So that was project one. I'm going to talk about another project that's a, a little bit more of kind of a classic application of rust stock that we're doing uh, with the city of Chicago. So uh, this is an overview of the full project. Um, basically, we're partnered with the city of Chicago, ComEd, which is the um, electric utility in the Chicago area, and a nonprofit called Elevate um, that does a lot of work in energy retrofits in the Chicago area. So it's a it's kind of a comprehensive project where we're going to do some modeling of the city of Chicago um, to, to basically the overall goal is to reduce energy use in homes by 50% um, and try to identify those strategies. Um, Elevate is then going to actually do a field validation of some of our recommended strategies where they're going to go into homes in Chicago and actually install some of the retrofit packages and so we can actually measure the home performance. Um, we're also doing some modeling where we scale up our recommendations for home retrofits to kind of citywide scenarios to provide some guidance for city of Chicago on how should they go about developing a, a um, plan for decarbonizing the building stock. Um, there's also a whole like environmental justice side of things. So understanding that these results we've mapped, how do they impact different communities? Um, the US uh, tends to have really um, segregated neighborhoods um, because of our, our, um, our racial history and the way that policies have rolled out. And so there, there tends to be pockets of really disadvantaged communities within cities. So we want to be sure as we um, you know, are recommending these scenarios, a lot of which involve electrification, electricity is more expensive than natural gas. Um, we want to have a good understanding of are we uh, recommending something that could have a really negative impact on low income households, especially. And then also um, the final step of the project is providing some general recommendations kind of to the larger region. Chicago is just one city in the Midwest. However, there's probably some, some takeaways based upon their stock that we can use to recommend to the larger region. So today I'm just going to be talking just about these first two parts, that the, the modeling parts that NREL has worked on. So the way that we went about this for Chicago is we um, first modeled um, a bunch of individual upgrades, kind of like one at a time upgrades. We have three, 60 different upgrades, but we put them into three different groups. Um, group one was what we called like fuel agnostic thermal upgrades. So it doesn't matter what heating fuel you have. Um, so for example, increasing insulation in your walls or increasing insulation of the attic. These things that would benefit the home regardless of what their heating fuel is. Group two um, was multi-fuel technologies. So these are things that could be run on either electricity, natural gas, or some other fossil fuel. And some of them involve fuel switching and some of them involve just um, increasing the efficiency of the equipment. And the third group, um, this is what we were calling easy swap. So this is swapping out appliances, basically. So you know, what if you put in a really high efficiency you know, refrigerator or things that um, basically any home could take um, pretty easily. From these initial 60 upgrades, we then group them into different packages, kind of groups of upgrades together since there's um, interactive effects, especially anything impacting the thermal performance of the home, and uh, put them into kind of three different groups of increasing uh, uh, aggressiveness of retrofit. So the group one are things that the current electric utility could fund right now with their existing efficiency programs. 
Group two is more comprehensive. It involves sometimes some fuel switching, but like a little bit more intense. And then group three is like full electrification. Like we're gonna go in, we're gonna be taking out a lot of the natural gas heating and going really high efficiency with the equipment. So what does some of these results look like? So from the 60 individual upgrades, um, these are the uh, top 20 that showed up. Um, you don't need to read these all in detail. You'll see the orange ones here are related. It's the multi-fuel equipment. So they're all related to heating basically. Um, and you see a, you'll see a lot of um, air source heat pumps and many split heat pumps on this list. So, um, and these are savings just from that one change alone. So you can see this graph is showing percent uh, EUI change. So um, there's, there's some of these heat pump upgrades. If you're switching uh, a non-deducted uh, fossil fuel-based system to a mini split heat pump, that alone is getting you to over 55% savings within the Chicago housing stock. Um, same thing with swapping out room air conditioners for heat pumps and also as a consequence, swapping out the heating system, um, really deep, deep savings. So this was a bit of a surprise to me um, that just the heating equipment alone could, could get to these without any other thermal changes to get some of these deeper savings. Um, also kind of for some context, this is the um, breakdown of kind of what's happening in Chicago. Uh, the vast majority of homes use fossil fuel based heating, 96%. Um, whereas only 4% are using electric. Um, we also were really interested in whether the home had ducts or did not have ducts. Chicago tends to have an older housing stock, so it really, would be difficult to go back in and put ducts into homes that are, don't already have it. Um, so it, it was basically informing what solution we were recommending. We were recommending many slit heat pumps um, for the non-ducted cases and air source heat pumps that had um, basically central air source heat pumps for homes that did not. So you can see the vast majority, you know, are fossil fuel ducted systems. So they, they usually had four air natural gas furnaces to start with. So what do the packages look like? So this is um, the colors here roughly correspond to the kind of groups of packages that I showed you. Um, the, the orange and uh, yellow are the full electrification. The blue are things that the utility could fund under their current programs. And the green is kind of like an in-between. It's a more comprehensive but not full electrification. We're showing kind of a variety of metrics that we're able to generate with Rouse Talk here. So if we were to apply these, these different packages, which put together these different upgrades, so this is, this is packages of upgrades, not individual upgrades. Um, kind of what, what sort of, the first column is the percent EUI savings. If you recall, the, that's the main metric for the project is trying to cut the, uh, the EUI in half. Um, then we are looking at saying things like how much uh, would the utility bill change for the homeowner? Um, what's the payback period? Um, how much CO2 does it save or not? Um, yeah, the cost of the initial capital cost of the upgrade. And then the final column is how many buildings in the city could actually receive this package of upgrades since they're tailored to different kind of segments of the stock based upon their existing heating system. So um, everything that's making the 50% mark has a heat pump. So it's kind of one of our big takeaways is that you, you can't get there really um, without uh, electrifying the, the heating and moving to heat pumps. Uh, the, just to highlight the best that a, a existing utility package, the existing incentive structure could get to, uh, if you replace a, an older boiler system with a more efficient boiler, um, you can get to about 36% savings, but it's so shy of our 50%. Um, and also just to highlight uh, this particular package with the STAR, that's the one that is applicable to uh, the uh, fossil fuel heated forced air furnace, um, the ducted home, so it's 81% of the stock. So you can see that applicable buildings column there at the end has um, a larger chunk of buildings than some of the other solutions where um, it's like switching out electric heating that is pretty, not very prevalent to start with. One of the advantages of Rust stock, um, so what I, I showed you on this previous graph, this is basically the average across these packages. So, but if you recall, Rust stock actually is drawing all of these different samples. And so this isn't just you know, a single model that's showing us this, it's a whole bunch of different building energy models. Mm -hmm. So um, another way we can look at it is, is so the, this box and whisker plots. Um, so this is looking at some of these same packages, but in different vintages of homes. We can also look at kind of the spread. Um, you know, like on average, we think that you know, some of these electrification packages that are shown here at the top are getting us to the 50%. But there are of course cases, there's homes where it doesn't meet 50%. And so some of what we're working on the project right now is understanding these tails of the distributions a little bit better. What makes it, um, gets us to the deeper energy savings. Um, and also from the cost perspective, as I mentioned, we are really um, sensitive in this project to um, understanding how disadvantaged communities especially might be impacted by some of the things that we're recommending. And so we're, the, the second column here is the um, cost savings. 
we see um, in a lot of cases that it's not cost effective and kind of understanding um, what makes it cost effective versus not, not cost effective. What are the different differentiators of the, the stock itself? So that's something that we're digging into right now. Um, also, just to mention another way to slice this, um, I was showing averages and then I showed kind of breakdown by vintage. Um, these are kind of some key, um, key, uh, a key typology for the Chicago area. So it's breaking it down into uh, wall time period of construction, um, the wall type, and the number of stories within the home. So it's just another way that we can break it down to, to be looking at the actual impact of these different measures in different segments of the stock. So we're not just you know, recommending blanket, like here's our one package that we say for everything. We're able to really drill down into the details and understand, okay, so if we're looking at this home type, kind of what range of outcomes might we expect and kind of what, is, what are the predictors of that? Okay, so I'm to my, I think I'm running out of time, but I'm on my final project and I will go quickly on this. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the LA100 project. So this is probably one of the more unusual applications for res stock. Um, so the Los Angeles 100% renewable energy study was much bigger than just building sector modeling. It actually um, spanned uh, a lot of different modeling groups at NREL. Um, so the LA City Council, LADWP is the um, electricity provider for the Los Angeles area. It's municipally owned, so the city owns their utility. And so the LA City Council um, had directed LADWP to evaluate pathways to get to 100% renewable energy. And there's a lot of other you know, kind of nuance to this, like not just get to 100% renewable energy, um, but you know, what are the impacts on um, the health of people living in Los Angeles? Are there, what's the change in the local economy? Um, you know, are there different disadvantaged communities um, that might benefit or be, you know, how, can, how can they be a part of the solution? And so this was a really comprehensive, uh, mostly grid modeling effort. Um, so it's the, first, uh, it's the first study that we're aware of that's ever been done that models a large electricity system, real electric system that has to uh, balance supply and demand. So this was time series forecasting. So we were projecting out um, residential load, but time series load. So I mentioned it's Redstock is built upon energy plus. Um, so we have that full time series output. Um, so then it was a question of calibrating it and getting it to a point where we could trust it to do future projections. Um, you know, it's a, a really complex analysis and involves lots of different modeling. So um, I was working on the rest stock side of the modeling. There's also comm stock for the commercial sector. There's transportation modeling for the EV load and industrial modeling. And then there's on the other side, on the supply side, a whole you know, modeling of the distribution system and um, different generators. And there's air quality modeling going on. So it was a really detailed study that provided a lot of information to the city of Los Angeles and um, helping them make decisions around their electric grid. Um, so these are four different supply scenarios. These are not the parts that we worked on with Restock, but basically different cases to try to, different ways to get to the 100% renewable energy um, goal by 2045, but kind of different pathways. Um, you know, one focusing on increasing transmission, some working, uh, some, you know, sometimes including biofuels or not including biofuels. On the right-hand side here though, you can see the different demands uh, projections that we did. So this is what, um, so as the, the grid team is trying to model all these different supply, we provided them different cases of um, demand projection. So how might electricity demand in LA evolve over time? You know, what if they kind of stick to like what's currently happening in current California building code? What if they do a big push for electrification? What if they do electrification and efficiency at the same time? Or what if they do electrification without the efficiency? Like how bad could that be for the electric system? Um, so to get to these answers, we had to go through a big customization uh, phase for taking Rustock and getting it to do really detailed, well-calibrated models for LA. California has a little bit of a different data landscape than a lot of the US. They have a lot more uh, local data on their building stock. So we were able to take advantage of some of that. Um, we, a big thing that we had to do for this project that Rustock does not normally do is we had to do projections. Rustock, you know, kind of at its core is a technical potential tool. You know, it models the current stock and then the technical potential of different upgrade measures to um, impact energy use. Um, in its current form, it does not do kind of these future scenario projections, but we had to build it out for this project. Um, so we have a, the first thing we did was a building stock growth model, um, basically trying to, you know, what's going to be constructed, what's going to be demolished. Um, we then did uh, electrification, uh, and we had some LA mandates that we were responding to and trying to set these different electrification cases. 
Um, and then we also were doing um, higher efficiency equipment. Uh, California has their own building co code and their own appliance standards. So we were being um, responsive to uh, current and near-term uh, appliance and building standards in the state of California. As I mentioned, um, actually we were partway through the project and the city of LA uh, dropped this brand new sustainability plan, uh, like made it public and we didn't have any sort of heads up. Uh, and they're, they're like, now you need to model and respond to this plan. And it's, it's actually a really interesting city plan. Um, it's a really comprehensive, it's really aggressive. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it involves carbon neutral buildings by 2050, uh, which you know, especially in 2019 seemed extremely aggressive for um, what most of the US was putting out. And so we had to respond and basically be able to um, model these different things. So in a lot of our, our demand cases, we're trying to be responsive to things uh, like carbon neutral buildings by 2050. So to give you an example of kind of what some of this um, looks like, so this is uh, an example of uh, some of the technology adoption that we did. So this is um, how we were envisioning cooling the fraction of cooling systems changing in LA going forward. So this isn't the, the model result, obviously, but this is what we're feeding into our stock as part of the projection. Uh, whereas the 2015 is kind of the base case, whereas LA right now. And then under these different, um, you know, business as usual, um, kind of some moderate efficiency, um, high efficiency, high electrification, and then the stress case, which is where you do the electrification without the efficiency, how does, how does cooling actually change? Um, all of our cases, we saw cooling increase. There's also a lot of kind of equity issues around access to cooling in Los Angeles. Parts of some of it's temperate. Some of the, the city is actually um, pretty hot, and it's, it's kind of a, a health issue to not have access to cooling. Um, but you can see there's a really big difference in the way that we're deploying different uh, equipment. So the Purple is kind of a traditional central air conditioner, um, whereas the, the blue is heat pumps. And so we also, um, which would also serve the heating loads in the homes as well. And the dark, dark blue is also heat, or sorry, the dark gray is also heat pumps, just many slits into the air source. So kind of what does this look like going forward? Um, so this is a, the total results, not just for, for residential buildings, but across the different sectors. So this is the, um, the total annual load in terawatt hours. So the yellow is residential. Um, so you can see, you know, there's there's um, an increase in load over time, but you can see a huge difference between, um, you know, that moderate case where you're just doing kind of basic efficiency versus the um, the other cases. If you notice, it goes up every single time because we're also even in between moderate and high because we're also electrifying. Um, however, if you're looking at difference between high and stress, which is basically stress is where you do electrification without the efficiency. Um, you're seeing a, 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 like 1.5 terawatt hour difference in the total amount of electricity demanded. So it's basically making a clear case for the role of um, energy efficiency during this, this future war electrifying. Um, we, this is also some of the study results uh, looking at it, um, not by total energy use, but by the, the peak demand. So this is for an electric system, this is what they're designing to um, for LEDWP. So um, we were able to look at uh, not just how the peak demand uh, magnitude increases over time, but we also looked at the timing of the peak. And the more heat pumps, especially you start putting the system, you start getting uh, kind of more unusual or shifted peaks and things like that, um, sometimes later in the day um, because of the, all that heating coming on as the sun goes down, um, for example. And uh, so from the study, we were able to take you know, these red stock results and, and look at actually the impacts of like a utility system level. Um, also, this I should also mention, I don't think I put it into the slide deck, but um, this study is now fully publicly available. There's a, a big series of reports online, and I can um, point you all to that if anyone's interested in kind of digging into it, because this is just a small piece of all the, the results included in the study. We also just found out that, uh, so this study has been is fully released in public. Uh, we also just found out that LA is going to be hiring NREL to do a next phase of LA 100. Um, it's going to be very focused on environmental justice and disadvantaged communities. Um, and so there's going to be a really strong role of, um, of residential building modeling as part of this. So kind of looking ahead, oops. So what's next for Rostock? I've given kind of just three example projects of things that we're doing with Rostock right now. Uh, we're in the middle of doing a major time series calibration for Rostock that it will be complete this fall where we're pulling uh, utility data from different parts of the country and actually doing time series calibration on the model. Um, to improve the accuracy of the time series projection or time series results from Rostock. Um, one of the, the big things I think we're going to kick off uh, in next year is doing national scale projection capabilities. 
Um, we built out built it up for LA. It was kind of uh, hacked together. It's not something that's easily scalable. There's a lot of software development that actually needs to go into being able to do this in a reproducible way. Um, and by projections, I mean being able to grow the building stock, have technology adoption models, um, also putting in appropriate future weather. Um, you know, using present day weather is not appropriate when you're trying to do a model of 2050. We need to be able to pull in some of the different um, climate change RCPs. Um, we're also uh, doing some other uh, things like uh, improving the way that we're, we're estimating CO2 impacts, uh, trying to incorporate more focus on disadvantaged communities and environmental justice. It's a big focus of the new, new US presidential administration. Um, and it's, it's housing is obviously something that's really tied to people's well being. So it's something we want to be able to comment on, or at the very least to be sure that the things that we're recommending aren't negatively impacting disadvantaged communities. Um, there's also a lot of ongoing work kind of looking at resilience um, and the role of residential buildings. Um, I, I don't know how much you all heard about some of the outages that happened in um, Texas, in the Southern United States during a cold snap. Texas is an area with really high electric heating that basically um, ended up having to do rolling blackouts during a, a cold snap. It got unusually cold for that area of the country. Um, and a lot of people ended up dying um, actually as a result of the cold. And so there's also this, this strong need to kind of understand, you know, how can buildings help play a role in resilience, either through passive survivability or through, um, you know, being able to, to have some of their own on-site generation and, or batteries and things like that. Um, I think that uh, it's still kind of being uh, worked out, but I think we're gonna see a lot of increased focus on doing local and regional modeling similar to what we've done with city of Chicago and city of Los Angeles. Um, I anticipate that we're going to be seeing a lot more emphasis on this. Um, the new presidential administration is really interested in providing technical support to different areas of the country and helping cities come up with um, you know, their own effective local solutions. So I anticipate that uh, we'll be doing kind of some more of these, these local projects with Rostock. Um, I should also mention um, Rex, one of the major surveys that underlies Redstock, as I mentioned, we're using one from 2009, which is pretty old at this point. It's also at the census division level, um, where Rex 2020 is being processed, and uh, it's the largest sample size that's ever been done. It's the first time that we're going to have any sort of um, state level data for every single state in the United States. So we're really excited to get some some more regional differentiation and some the building characteristics where we're having to make assumptions about whole regions right now. So um, I know that I've gone over at this point, but uh, I will now take questions. Great, thank you very much. And uh, I, for one, already thought it was a really inspiring uh, uh, presentation. So uh, anyone who has questions, you can put them uh, in the chat. Some have already done so. so oh, they, okay, you find the chat. We can get started with. Um, maybe to, to make it easy for you, you can, uh, check, but I'll read out some questions, uh, maybe uh, moderate a bit. Um, and so uh, anyone in the audience who still has questions, uh, please feel free to add them to the chat. Um, so maybe starting with um, a basic uh, methodological question um, from Arnold. Um, so you start with this uh, probability network. Um, and so how do you fill in the blanks uh, when you don't know the conditional probabilities or the intercorrelations, let's say, between the different... Uh... Yeah, it's a tricky thing. So sometimes we just don't put the dependency, you don't put a dependency in. So if we have something that we know for, it's for a region, but we don't know kind of the as local as we like to get, we just leave the whole thing for the whole region. So, you know, for example, if we know the, the break, so if you know you have a fossil fuel home, and we might have a breakdown nationally of the equipment that is served, you know, within the fossil fuel heating category. If we don't have a regional dependency, we just don't break it down. We use the same same thing nationwide. So um, we, you know, where possible, we're trying to put in these these. It's really a question of where do we put the probability, where do we put the dependencies, you know, because obviously just using the same distributions of everything nationally doesn't make sense. So there's a lot of also kind of engineering judgment. So for example, you know, some of this. So if you have a home that has natural gas heating, we know that there, there's gonna be a different probability distribution of them having natural gas clothes drying, for example, because they already have a natural gas connection to the house. So we put a dependency on heating fuel because you know, kind of from a logical standpoint, we recognize that there's a relationship between those two. 
Um, occasionally, we have to use really engineering judgment and like fill in blanks completely. Um, but it's not that often that we're like, you know, completely making something up. More often, we're using less specific data and having to use a large, you know, re larger regional or national distribution instead of a more localized. Right. Um, well, as a, uh, something that, that might be interesting for you to look into, uh, a PhD that will be defended on Friday at oh. Cape Division um, looked at uh, a methodology to, to use uh, intercorrelation matrices on uh, individual buildings to match um, probabilities, let's say, uh, oh. different uh, things. Yeah, I would be interested to see that if you don't mind sharing with me. Um, well, it's going to be defended on Friday. I, I think I can send you the link to the public defense, but uh, we'll or, talk about that. Or, or the dissertation afterwards, whatever, you know, yeah. there's no big rush. <laughs> All right. Um, so the uh, um, next question from Nathan. Um, so in Europe, there's a, an increase in focus on life cycle assessment with these kinds of things, because there's a worry that um, yeah, the energy cost of the added measures might offset the, the potential savings. So is this mm -hmm. on the horizon for rest up or how are you? I don't, I don't know if it's on the horizon for like an a, like a tight integration with rest talk. Um, I think that the US Department of Energy, which as I mentioned is our main funding agency. So it tends to be uh, what DOE is doing tends to be our focus. DOE just now I'd say within the last year or two has started to recognize the importance of life cycle energy and life cycle carbon. Um, so I think that really uh, the lab is still kind of at some of the, the basic stage of grappling, like how do we account for it within this framework? You know, longer term, I could see, I don't know if it would be a tight integration with Rostock, where we're doing like a full, you know, material life cycle analysis ahead of the retrofits. But as we get down to where we're recommending different solutions, like I think we clearly want to be supplementing that with, um, with a better estimate of kind of these other life cycle impacts, you know, especially when you're talking about, um, for example, some of these like high insulating foams and things like that, that have, you know, potentially huge impacts, um, carbon impacts and things like that. Uh, we want to be really careful before saying like, this is the solution, you must do this uh, without taking that in. So I, I don't anticipate a tight coupling, but I do anticipate kind of some more careful evaluation and how we're ranking these given the life cycle impacts. Um, so I think this kind of links to, to the next question by, by Chris, um, which is um, when evaluating um, potential uh, upgrades that you recommend, uh, 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 for example, in the LA100 study, um, are you factoring in or are the clients, which is then the, the LA uh, Energy Department, factoring in the fact that they uh, uh, will have to invest less in the development of the grid based on, for example, this uh, electrification uh, or high electrification scenario that you um, were proposing? That's, yeah, that's correct. Um, so we did not do like the utility cost analysis, um, but LADWP, like in that project, was doing that analysis on their own. So costs weren't part of like kind of our scope, but they they were obviously looking at that. And one of the things about the LADWP uh, the LA100 study that was really appealing to LADWP is that they were increasing their um, they were increasing the total amount of energy being sold because the way that you know electricity is monetized is um, it's on a per kilowatt hour basis, but at the same time you weren't seeing the same uh, proportionate increase in the the peak, which is what's driving the utility infrastructure build out. So they're really interested in the role of efficiency and basically keeping that peak down where they're able to still electrify everything and sell more electricity to all their customers. Um, so it's it's definitely a part that um, utility, not just within our modeling, but across the US, um, utilities do value um, uh, energy efficiency and they are considering avoided infrastructure costs. Uh, when, even just when they're deploying, you know, kind of a typical utility incentive uh, package, I think it's still undervalued by utilities uh, compared to, I mean, it's, it's a really cost-effective way for them to avoid building out um, you know, all their transmission uh, and distribution infrastructure as well as new power plants. And I think it's it's probably an underutilized and undervalued resource by utilities, but it is considered. Okay, um, that kind of segues into uh, questions about affordability. Uh, Nathan had a, a second question and I also have one myself. Uh, okay. Nathan's question is about, yeah, um, what we see in Europe is that in current market conditions, um, uh, the the uh, payback time of energy saving measures is typically 
not really interesting. It, it's either too long or negative. Um, so it, the, the drive towards uh, carbon neutral building stock really comes from tightening uh, regulations. So is this something yeah. you also see in the States and, and how is the reaction to that since it's very distributed in terms of uh, where regulations are, are specified? I think we're really struggling with this because there's not really um, there's not really existing you know like retrofit codes or anything like that. You know, there's codes for new buildings, um, but I think that the U.S. is really struggling with what are the right mechanisms to try to get these retrofits into the stock. Yeah, because um, there are some things that are even for things that do have quicker payback periods. It still is really difficult to get you know an individual um, homeowner or, or or even worse a renter or landlord to make a decision. Um, to, to, you know, because that's not how usually energy decisions are made. If you need a new furnace in your home, even if it would have a reasonable payback period, um, you're often replacing it under like an emergency condition. You know, like your heat has gone out in the winter and you're going to buy whatever the guy that shows up to sell you a furnace is going to sell you. Um, so I think that uh, the going for a cost perspective alone is really a tricky way to, to think to, it, it's not going to be the solution to do these deep energy retrofits. So I think we're, so there's some cities that are doing, um, so I, I, appliance standards has been a really traditional way in the US, like just increasing that like minimum efficiency that of things that can be sold in the market. So at least if you're buying the furnace, that's just the, the least efficient one on the market, it's still better than if you bought it five years ago. Um, and um, a, another, uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, so I, you know, appliance standards is one way. Uh, another thing you're seeing right now is you're seeing some cities that are trying to force electrification by not allowing it in new construction or basically trying to, uh, you know, if anything happens, like basically shut down natural gas distribution to different areas and things like that. So really trying to force the adoption of electric technologies that way. But in terms of, you know, through existing building codes, it's just, you see like maybe one or two cities in the US trying it. Um, we also don't do any sort of, um, like like uh, national labeling. So I know in Europe, you have like the energy performance certificate that at least is collecting some basic information and communicating some basic information. Um, even if it's not forcing a retrofit, like there's some awareness among buyers and renters of what's what's actually happening. Um, in the US right now, we don't have you know anything like that for housing. There's some other some metrics out there, but they're not mandated. Uh, consumers are not familiar with them. So I think that this implementation is a really big challenge, um, you know, because it's tricky through existing um, utility pathways. Utilities do the most of kind of the direct install retrofits of anybody, um, but you know they're limited by regulatory um, kind of what they can do. Like an electric utility can't go in and do mass electrification of, because of the way they're regulated. So I, th I think this is something that we're really struggling with is, is how do we actually make this happen? Like, what does this look like? Because um, right now it's utility direct install. Sometimes for the deeper energy retrofits, kind of like one off, like. Nonprofits working with like a low income, like housing um, development or something like that. But I think that uh, we're really struggling with kind of what are the right mechanisms to make this happen. Right. Um, yeah. I, I, the question I had kind of uh, goes, uh, builds on that in, in the sense that you also stressed uh, the, the interest in um, uh, environmental justice. And I think this is really common when you're uh, talking about uh, building stock modeling that it's. Um, uh, methodology and science and policy become very intertwined. Um, and so um, a recent study for Belgium uh, that came out um, tried to estimate what was the, the, the financing capacity of, uh, of people and compare that to what would be necessary to upgrade their um, homes to um, uh, 2050 proof. So, so let's say carbon neutral building stock level. And they found that over 50% of um, uh, Belgians uh, or homeowners, let's say, uh, to be more precise, um, lack substantial uh, funds and even uh, the possibility to finance uh, the, the necessary um, uh, measures to, to get to that level. Um, so, um, is this the kind of work that uh, is also included in the environmental justice? part of uh, the rest stock work or is this yeah uh, separate or yeah, so, are... no so i think that'll be part of it um so basically the we had an administration change in january so we have a new new president so basically suddenly we're re-gearing for everything 
uh, where we had could only talk about jobs in the economy before. Uh, now all of a sudden the focus is climate change and environmental justice, which we're all thrilled about. Um, but you know, in terms of ramping up capabilities, I think we're still, I think the administration is still kind of trying to figure out like exactly what do they want from us. And we're also trying to gear up to understand exactly what they want. But I think that, you know, issues like that, like understanding, I think that kind of at a basic level, the first thing is, is probably me focused on like energy poverty. Because I think a lot of the most impacted communities that we're going to be concerned about are actually not going to be homeowners, but renters. Um, you know, we have a, a huge portion of the country that rents um, and tends to correlate, um, you know, with minority groups and lower income. Um, and so I think that, I think that there, though, there's going to be a piece probably looking at the capacity for, you know, owner occupied homes to be, um, to be able to be funding, you know, retrofit and energy affordability. But I think probably our primary focus is going to be on the, uh, the renter occupied dwelling units. Um, so uh, from that, I would like to jump to um, kind of a, uh, yeah, something that uh, relates to the types of measures that you then recommend. Um, what we often find is that um, yeah, piecemeal retrofits of uh, existing homes are often not that cost effective uh, mm -hmm. in the long run. Um, so uh, in Europe, there's this big drive towards deep retrofits, um, which is basically uh, stripping the whole building or uh, tearing it down and rebuilding uh, according to, to new code standards. Um, how common is this uh, in the US uh, for residential buildings? I don't think it's, I don't think that sort of, so in terms of like the tear down, you do see a lot of, uh, like tear down of old buildings and new construction, but it's never driven by energy. It's always driven by like, you know, somebody wants to buy an old crappy 1950s house and put in a nice, you know, brand new one. So you see that a lot like in the Denver area where I live. Um, but I'd say I don't see any sort of like, you know, massive push, you know, for stock turnover from, from like an energy environmental perspective at all. Um, for the deep energy retrofits, um, this is something that, uh, the, the typology study that we worked on was part of kind of a larger DOE initiative to figure out deep energy retrofit strategies for the US. Um, they're working a lot with industry partners to figure out what those might look like. So they're using, you know, like the energy sprung model is kind of like an inspiration for what we might see happen in the US in terms of, um, you know, kind of combining, uh, you know, prefabricated, you know, panels that might be able to come in and, and do retrofits. But I'd say in, you very rarely right now see like these sort of like really deep energy retrofits happening. It, if you see it happening, it's usually somebody that, you know, studies buildings or studies energy and just wants to do it for themselves as opposed to any sort of like mass, you know, deployment of things like that. Uh, maybe it's a mis misconception of mine, but I, I would expect that um, uh, tearing down and rebuilding since the big majority is wood frame construction would be actually a cheaper solution in the, in the US um, compared to here in Europe. It, it might be. Um, I mean, that's why you, for, for just like real estate, like real estate value reasons of what you see a lot of these these homes in Denver, they're called scrapes. You take the old home, you scrape it off and you put like a, you know, some new fancy, it's at least in the new, um, you know, Denver building code. Sometimes you'll put two units on there instead of the one original single family. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's cost effective. Property values are really high here. Uh, and the land is worth more than the house at that point to, to put the new one on. Um, yeah, but I, I, uh, I don't see people thinking about it very much from the energy perspective. Right. Um, something that uh, Nathan mentions is, um, well, uh, you showed that there's a, a lot of variability in, in the age of uh, buildings. Um, typically here in Europe, uh, well, or at least in Belgium, we have very uh, long turnover times uh, between buildings, uh, while in the US uh, people move uh, much more uh, on average every seven years, Nathan claims. Um, so um, does that affect the, the um, yeah, both the, the um, amount of opportunities to come in and do retrofits? Uh, because typically in our case, we see that that happens when uh, a new, uh, new inhabitants move in. Um, or on the other hand, as Nathan suggests, um, uh, the fact that there's so fast turnover, um, people tend to avoid to, to invest in their home and just um, uh, keep it as it is, uh, repaint it and sell it on again. So it actually delays investment. Yeah, I, so I, I don't know if, um, 
if I'd agree that uh, just because it's a short time period in the home that homeowners don't invest, but I don't know if they're investing in the efficiency side of things. They're investing in things that they think will get them a higher resale value, right? Especially because if you're moving and constantly buying your house, you want to do something like big and showy that's, you know, a new perspective buyer is going to walk in and go, wow, like I want to buy this house. And there's not that sort of like market recognition of, oh, wow, you have a really efficient heating system. Like this, you know, like do you have a furnace that works? Like that's the, the level that they're looking at. So I think, I think that uh, it's an interesting point. Um, I've heard some talk about trying to do something at um, point of turnover or point of sale of trying to basically that be the point where we force some up, upgrades to buildings um, or rental units. Um, I don't know of any locality in the US that's actually, there's probably somewhere, but I don't know of any place that's actually effectively enforced that, like forcing some upgrade, you know, energy upgrades to buildings at that, that point of turnover. Um, but I think it, it is an interesting opportunity, especially just kind of looking at the comparative statistics, um, you know, that maybe there are, are these, um, these opportunities to, to try to put something in at this point of turnover. All right. Um, yeah, looking at the questions, there, there was one more question by Chris, but that was also about uh, the life cycle assessment. So I think we've covered uh, most of it. So uh, anyone in the audience who still has a question, now is your last chance. In the meantime, I'll, I'll have a, a crack at a, a last question. Um, uh, we've had uh, the pleasure of, well, from our side at least, uh, of working with you in, in Annex 70 over the last couple of years. Um, so uh, we spend a lot of time in this Annex um, trying to find the words to speak the same language about uh, building stock modeling. Um, uh -huh. So. Um, how important is this type of international collaboration, in your opinion, to move this uh, field forward, which seems to be developing at different speeds and different regions in the world um, at the moment? I, I mean, in my opinion, it's really vital, um, you know, because like we get stuck in our own context. You know, we have, you know, like we have problems with how we're dealing with things in the US and like, you know, with, from a modeling perspective and like a housing retrofit perspective, and you get so stuck in your own context that sometimes it's hard to think kind of outside the box of like, okay, what are other ways that other countries have approached us? What other techniques have they developed that might be applicable to my context? So, so in my opinion, like that sort of like international collaboration is really important. Yeah, yes, we each have our individual challenges, but we still have a lot that we can learn from one another. Right, well, um... On that happy note, I hope um, international collaboration in the near future will be more than just looking at uh, more screen time. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so too. I, I am sad that I wasn't able to come to Belgium for this. Yeah, uh, would have been very nice, but um, we'll definitely uh, have a rain check on that one. Um, so thank you so much for this uh, lecture. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think I speak for everyone uh, if I say, uh, that we learned a lot and then uh, um, it's time for us to go to bed and for you to enjoy <laughs> the rest of your day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk and um, feel free to reach out to me You know, if there's things that come up afterwards. Um, I should also put a plug in that uh, because this area is becoming really, really important in the US, there's um, NREL is hiring a lot You know, across you know, kind of internships, postdocs, full-time employees. So if anyone is, is interested in kind of a, an international experience, uh, feel free to let me know that as well. It's a really nice way to end this lecture. So <laughs> thanks and uh, see you soon. Maybe just one more thing. Um, well, yep. Janet, again, thanks for the inter interesting uh, presentation. Um, the last presentation in this series will be held uh, May 6th by uh, Martin de Hilte from Vito. And he will be talking about uh, um, the renovation challenge in Belgium we should be starting renovating 100,000 buildings a year. So that's the topic he will be addressing. So uh, everybody welcome to uh, attend that uh, lecture as well. Um, Janet, thank you very much. And thank you. Have a nice day, which just starts, I presume, or just <laughs> it, it, midday, but yeah, so midday. halfway. Through. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye bye.